Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that a keto diet may protect your eyes, well, at least if you're a mouse, and probably if you're a human. According to new research published in the Journal of Neuroscience, switching mice destined to develop glaucoma onto a low-carb, high-fat diet, uh, which is the template for Bulletproof, although it's not always keto, uh, but it protects the cells of the retina and their connections to the brain. And the study adds to a bunch of other findings that this kind of diet has neuroprotective effects on Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS. Uh, you might have noticed that a lot of the research in my book, Headstrong, about mitochondria relied on research on those three things because when the brain breaks, that's bad. When you do things that make broken brains heal and you do those to brains that are already well, they kind of kick ass more, which is the idea behind it. And in this study, they concluded that higher rates of glaucoma in people with diabetes also suggest a potential connection between that eye disease and metabolic stress. And the reason I'm bringing this to your attention is that when you make your metabolism work better, your risk of every disease and your risk of dying from any cause other than a piano falling on your head goes down. And uh, there's no uh, double-blind clinical trials on pianos falling on your head either, but we just kind of know that. Now, if you like Bulletproof Radio, you like what you hear, I would love it if you took a few seconds to go to bulletproof.com slash iTunes, which will get you right over to the Apple page where you can leave a five-star review and say, hey, this show is cool. I'd appreciate it. Today's guest is Andrew Hessel. Imagine building something like a cell phone or a car or a house, and that one thing just reproduced itself. Well, that's kind of the idea behind what the Human Genome Project Right or GP Right intends to do, starting with the basics. They want to build a human cell from the ground up and complete it with all the DNA that's required to produce more human cells. And the idea is that by mastering this technique, we could wipe out diseases that we just don't understand yet because in order to build something from the ground up, you have to understand it in a way that you don't understand when you're looking at something that's already built. And Andrew, today's guest, is the CEO of Humane Genomics, which is a seed stage company developing virus-based therapies for cancer, starting with dogs. And he's also a co-founder of GP Right or Genome Project Right, which is an international scientific effort working to engineer large genomes, including ours. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Dave. When... I decided I wanted to interview you. I, I checked you out, and, and the GP right, the Human Genome Project right, is one of those things that sounds like science fiction. And I looked at what you're doing, and you describe yourself as a synthetic biologist, which is a, a set of words that did not exist even 15 years ago. What the heck is a synthetic biologist? Well, what's a biologist? What's a molecular biologist? Um, uh, synthetic biologists are, are uh, it's a new field. Um, where you don't take apart genomes and try and understand what they do. That's kind of the reverse engineering of biology. Uh, it's, it's aspiring to go and design and build genomes from scratch. Uh, and if you can build a genome from scratch, you build organisms from scratch. The two are, are completely linked. You're starting your work with viruses, but to date, at least in my understanding, no one's ever been able to build a life from the ground up. We can put all the building blocks together, but there's some animating force, uh, to quote a 17th century alchemist or something, uh, that, that makes it turn on and, and start working. Have we cracked that code yet? Well, there's a group of people that are trying to crack it at the very low level and build all the cellular machinery from the ground up. But uh, I take a different point of view, and again, I speak for myself, not the field, but but all life on this planet, uh, from a simple bacterium to all the way to you and me and uh, and plants as well, have a common architecture when it comes to how the cell operates. Uh, so it's essentially conserved, even though there's millions of species of animals. So, it, you don't really have to build life from scratch. You, the only difference between these different mm, these different organisms is really their genomes. The genome with the common architecture, the machinery of the cell, 
can create massive diversity. So I'm not out to create new life forms in the sense of rebuilding architectures from the ground up. I'm just out to reprogram them and make uh, new versions of life forms. So, so you're going to start with a platform that's basically a bacteria or a virus or something, although viruses may not really be alive. Uh, and then uh, and, and sort of do rebuilding from the foundations up rather than assembling a bunch of amino acids and fats and saying, there you go, I've got a life form. Well, well, you can look at it this way. The machinery of life is conserved and has been for four billion years on the planet. Think of it as a really powerful printer. Um, uh, you know, all you have to really do to to make a new life form is just create send new code to the printer. So I'm not out to rebuild life from scratch. I'm just out to learn how to program it and make versions of life that that do really you know, really useful and powerful positive things. If you took off your uh, what's possible glasses and projected yourself 50 years into the future and you had unlimited resources, what life would you create? Oh, wow. That, no one has ever asked me that. Um, uh, I tend to be very pragmatic and I tend to work bottom up. So just uh, as, a, as a foundation. The thing that I've been talking about um, recently because it's really pragmatic is I've got, I've got two young children. One's three and a half and the other one's nine months. And, and the types of things I want um, to build are things that just make it easier to support kids because that's what I'm thinking about on yeah. a day-to-day -day basis. And, and um, honestly, the, the, I, I talk about the milk tribble. I want a small furry object with a nipple <laughs> that just produces milk. So I don't have to make bottles. I don't have to, you know, I can actually feed the baby. And and if it purrs and coos, uh, that would be terrific too. And if, you know, once it's kind of been drained, this disembodied breast, put it in the garden, it grows into a beautiful flower. Um, so that's kind of one thing I'd like. But, um, you know, on a more pragmatic basis, uh, I'm not a much of a home, a home owner, keeper, maintainer. I would really just like to plant seeds and grow homes. I think that would be totally awesome. So now you're entering the world of cyberpunk, Neil Stevenson sort of uh, sort of science fiction, where you have this idea of you, you plant a seed that that literally could grow into a tree that has the components of a house and is alive. And um, why not? Why chop the trees down and plane them and make lumber when you could just have a a large object that's made of wood? It's living. It's photosynthesizing. It's maintaining the right temperature for human inhabitation. It's got it just it just seems like we've got this incredible machinery now, the cell to start working with. Um, uh, and and we really don't know how far we can take that machinery in terms of science fiction. We know where it's been limited in terms of evolution and nature. Um, but nature's got a different, really different set of objectives compared to human intention. So I'd just like to see how far we can take the cell. <laughs> Are we going to see that in our lifetimes? I think it's going to happen quickly. These things tend to start off pretty slow because you're, you're feeling them out, you're learning the basics. But the beautiful thing about life, if you kind of look at it as a manufacturing platform the way that I do, it's everywhere already. It's universal on this planet. As deep as you can drill a hole, you'll find microbes. Clouds are filled with microbes. You know, so life is literally everywhere. And and there's only one programming language, and it's been the same language for billions of years. So I think the more that we people get into this and start to concentrate their their research and development and put it into a community, the the faster this is going to snowball. It, it's like you don't have to go build a new factory. The, the factories are already there. You just have to learn how to how to put a design into the into the factory. You're a faculty member at the Singularity University, and I've, I've lectured there and uh, actually have an adjunct faculty position too, even though I've never actually taught a class there. And one of the things that they cover there is nanotechnology and the idea that, well, we don't have to make life forms. We can just make tiny little robots that self-replicate and do essentially the same thing that life does. Uh, but one of the the scenarios that we come across there is the gray goo scenario, where you make the wrong robot that turns everything it meets into another nano machine, and pretty soon the whole planet is basically lifeless except for little robots trying to eat each other. How do you know that you won't make synthetic biology that just makes organic gray goo? Uh, well, 
Man, um, it, I, I remember a, a synthetic biologist, one of the founding people of the field of synthetic biology, Tom Knight, uh, kind of laughing at this idea and saying, you know, biology is nanotechnology that actually works. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and and when you when you look at the machinery of the cell, it is nanoscale, uh, and and but it works with a very different set of principles. I think. I think if you t just take a look at bacteria and fungi and, and other, you know, just single celled organisms, that's what takes complex objects and decomposes them back into the goo that other things grow out of. We, we call it soil. <laughs> um, so, so I don't really have a fear of creating a biological goo that just turns everything into mush. Um, that's kind of what happens after we die. So I suppose the closest thing to that would be, you know, some sort of pandemic where the, where it knocks out most life. Um, I, I, I think that if that type of thing could spontaneously arise, it would have already have been tried out by nature. Uh, I think in general, nature is the most secure technology there is. Um, it is really hard to hack biology. There are numerous safety systems and checksums and mechanisms, you know, compared to computers. It's just not that much of a worry for me. Uh, that, that's a fair answer. When I wrote uh, my book Headstrong about mitochondria, I delved into the realm of, of quantum biology. Uh, which is, uh, you say the word quantum, and immediately you've got people with robes and crystals and, and things like that who are using the term. Um, but it actually is a real term in quantum biology, and there are strange quantum effects happening where DNA releases a biophoton for a femtosecond every 40 seconds or so. And um, we know that mitochondria communicate via lasing, uh, also with biophotons. And uh, there's quantum tunneling going on inside there. Do we really know enough <laughs> to build that from the ground up? Because it, it seems like there's some things going on in cells that cellular biologists don't understand yet. Oh, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I look at uh, just an average enzyme, you know, these one of these biological catalysts that turn, you know, s substrates into different products as being... Uh, the almost magical chemists. They do things that, that organic chemists can only dream of. So, so we know that they're manipulating matter in ways that we have a lot of difficulty understanding today and even modeling, because as you note, some of the effects are quantum that they've been able to tap into. Um, that being said, uh, you don't have to understand all of the machinery of the cell to be able to reprogram it because the, you just have to move up to the level of DNA code and programming to be able to understand how to build uh, certain structures. Uh, the more you can understand and model, the better. But we, we don't have a unified model of even a simple cell the same way we have a unified model of planet Earth as we do with Google Earth, that's where we're constantly layering on more and more detailed information. So the, the cell is clearly a very complex machine but I think as we start to focus on doing this type of modeling, as we start to you know, really build a, a field of biology that isn't just a few specialists, that, that is really like mo much more like the field of computing, uh, where you get people from basically all walks of life, all industries kind of adding to it, I, I think we'll start to crack some of, some of the lower level problems you know, below the programming of DNA. And what's the time frame you think that's going to happen in? Uh, again, these things are all accelerating um, because, uh, again, if you look at if if you just look at the DNA sequencing world, um, you know where the where where the Human Genome Project was launched in 1990 with a three billion dollar budget and a 15 year time frame. It, it came in two years early and on budget, which for a government project almost never happens, and that's because. The technology of reading DNA advanced so quickly, even during those 15 years, that they were able to hit their targets. And and since the first, you know, since the the genome was essentially complete uh, in 2003, that technology has only continued to accelerate. At times, uh, uh, outpacing Moore's law by by over 500 percent. And it, it's not over today. 
you can go and get your genome, uh, complete genome, not just sampling like 23andMe, your complete genome commercially for 18 months for under $1,000. Uh, and what I hear is that it'll be as low as $200 in the next 12 months. Uh, right. if you, if you, you know, granted there's always some caveats, but, but, but that's amazing to go from billions of dollars to a couple hundred bucks in a time frame of, of under 20 years. Um, so, so I think we're going to see the same thing on the synthesis side and even on the comprehension and design side as we start applying the latest efforts in, in computing and in DNA synthesis. How is this going to affect uh, our everyday lives in five years? Uh, I think that you'll start to see it soonest in the world of DNA sequencing. You know, like already I've been impressed that DNA sequencing, DNA testing, let's just look at it as testing, yeah. has, has exploded in the last couple of years. Like it's just taken off. Today you see ads for 23andMe or Ancestry or National Geographic all the time. They're big sellers uh, on, on, you know, at Christmas time or on Prime Day. That's amazing. So DNA testing has suddenly become something we're a lot more comfortable with. Um, I think I think what we're starting to see now is kind of a next generation testing industry that's going to um, explode, you know, and not bring in a you know five or ten million people. I think it'll they'll figure out the business model so that everyone can can be sequenced in the same way that basically anyone that wants one gets a free Gmail or Facebook account. I think we're going to see. I, I think the trend in DNA sequencing is that it's going free and probably will flip to uh, actually starting to pay the contributors um, in some way to incentivize them to join. So I think in five years, we're going to see a mushrooming of DNA testing, which will bring millions, maybe, maybe hundreds of millions of genomes online over the next decade. Um, and that's just going to be a giant sandbox for accelerating R&D in life science, as well as allowing us, and by lowering the cost of sequencing in general, um, allowing us to sequence the world around us, whether it's our microbes or plants, animals that we share the environment with. So that, that's going to be the biggest change. And all of that is just feedstock for being able to better design useful biology going forward. Um, but the DNA synthesizers and even the design tools have lagged the the reading of DNA and tools for comprehending and 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 trying to figure out what that DNA does. And there are some parallels from my my career in technology. Uh, many people by now have heard of, of CAD or computer aided design, and almost everything you buy today was designed on a computer. First, so you could look at how it would you know, rotate in space, and then it's sent to a machine that makes die parts and cuts it and, and things like that, or casts it. Uh, and that in, that includes you know the lid to your ready to drink uh, bulletproof cold brew <laughs> that was that was designed on a CAD machine somewhere or with CAD software. And then about uh, 25 years ago, they started taking those tools and saying, well, why would you use them to build structural steel? Why don't we use them to design semiconductors? And I, I did a lot of work in my early career on putting a company called Synopsys online, uh, which was one of the, the big public companies um, doing that. And it turns out that, that companies were spending hundreds of millions of dollars trying to make it more efficient for an engineer to line transistors up in the right way to do something, and that visualizing on a computer was really powerful. Uh, but those tools are are mostly missing for biology. I mean, you, you still see biologists talking about uh, A, C, G, and T, and but you never see computer scientists talking about zeros and ones because they sort of have a language and a design environment to write code. When am I going to be able to tell my kids, hey, go take a class using this graphical design tool to build some DNA to do something cool? That is an absolutely great question. Um, and uh, I've said the same things uh, uh, for years. In, in 2012, I joined the largest CAD company uh, in the world, Autodesk, with the intention of helping them build a BioCAD. And in fact, they did a, a, a very good job on that front. And, and they have a, a tool now called Genetic Constructor, which- Oh, there is one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they made one. Um, 
uh, and and now there's other groups coming along. One of them, one of the more interesting ones, is a company called Asimov that that really takes the circuit design from EDA, electronic design, and and uh, electronic design automation, and and directly t- using that language moves it into biological circuit design that can do really high order logic. And it's remarkable. So you, you've hit the nail on the head. The day we can sit there with a design tool and draw the organism that we want, I want a dragon, <laughs> and, and let the software figure out the complexities of, of the cellular and, and metabolic designs and just hit print, that will be really cool. We're not there yet, but I can tell you that's what the field is aspiring to this century. I published a report a couple of years ago on, on my Facebook page about a biologist somewhere who said, oh, there's a problem with a, a moth that's eating some agricultural crop. And it turns out there's a type of mold that kills the moth. So we just tweaked the mold a little bit. We just added a, a really strong neurotoxin from spider venom and something else from a poisonous snake to the mold. Now the mold kills those moths really well, so we let it go. And now, <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> and now I I've did a documentary on toxic mold and how we've had an incredible expansion of uh, Aspergillus and Fusarium and making way more toxins than before that are affecting human biology at the mitochondrial level and others, the, the even DNA damage. And I'm going, ah. So now, if we have the tools you just talked about and we put those in the hands of crackpots like this biologist who said, let me solve a short-term problem and create a giant big problem, Man, uh, do we really want everyone walking around with dragons? Well, yeah, probably not. Um, I, I, I actually don't worry about the dragons so much as, as what you say, just the, yeah. the things like viruses and, and single-celled organisms that replicate very quickly and are, and are pretty hard to wipe out. Any, I usually say that anything as large as, as a chicken or a pig, you know, we're pretty good at hunting. <laughs> so, but when it comes to the microorganisms, we just don't have the right tools for that. So no, you, you raise a really good point. And, and this is, this is one of the reasons why, um, I, I think that the genome project right is, is just so necessary today. Um, we need to, we need to start thinking collectively. I mean, humanity about, some of the the opportunities and risks with these types of technologies. We, we've had agriculture for millennia. So we know that agriculture is a very good thing. Being able to do selective breeding of crops, being able to manage animals and, and plants and even forests and, and, and ecosystems is, is important for uh, humans to survive on this planet. Um, and, and the tools of, and, and the platform of biology uh, from a cellular level is universal. We can't, we can't prevent access to it. Yep. So we have to start thinking in, in new ways about how, how we channel this stuff to, for good and how we defend it against bad. The problems are very similar to what we've been learning by doing with the internet. The internet is a platform, can be used for good or bad. Today, most of our lives are, are, are tied in some way to the internet and electronic systems. Uh, our economies are tied to it. Um, we, we know that there's risks, but we don't, we don't prohibit the system. We, we've learned how to, we're learning how to, how to regulate it and manage it. I think we're gonna see a lot of the same types of lessons that we're learning in cybersecurity be applied to biological security. With, but I like to point out, biological, biological security has already figured out a lot of those lessons. It's a two-way it, learning. It's called an immune system. And right. And, and the immune system is amazing because it's actually a molecular defense against most foreign, you know, foreign molecules. The, the, the bigger biological approach, and the one that, that you and I probably aren't friends with, is one that's well known in computer science. It's called redundant array of inexpensive systems. You might have heard of a RAID hard drive. It means you have five hard drives in case one fails. So the way Mother Nature designs things, oh, we've got a few billion people. I don't care if a billion of them fail, the other ones will keep the life going. And if you're one of the billion that, quote, failed, um, you probably didn't like that outcome. And, and that's that you know, personal interest versus uh, billion-year time-span biology interest. Uh, it, it's, it's very true that Mother Nature doesn't care about 
you or me or any one person at all. <laughs> they, they care about, you know, is, is there enough life uh, to sustain itself? Uh, if, if you can even describe caring to, you know, distributed system uh, emergent like that. Um, I, I want to, I want to go back. You talked about what will change in five years and it's uh, genetic testing. I sequenced my genome three, four years ago. I've got a big binder with all this stuff. And mostly it said you have a 10% risk of this and you have an 8% chance that you carry some gene that could make uh, a defect in, in some of your offspring and you, ha- you, know, you metabolize caffeine this way. Uh, but in terms of actionable information, it, it seems like almost everything is epigenetic. If your risk is a little higher of this, then don't do the things that would make that gene turn on. Uh, how much epigenetics, this idea that the environment around you changes genetic expression how much of that goes into gp right and the way you think about things like, like maybe instead of editing your dna just turn on the lights at, in the morning oh well, I, I i agree like we we still do the field of epigenetics only came after genetics so and it's still so it's even younger but i think um so I, I can't say a lot of that is baked into GP right but i i want to be clear gp right wasn't started because we need to make more human genomes. That, that's not the point. If you, I want to just, I just want to give you a little bit of history. Yeah. Like it, the first genome project was founded in the 1980s, uh, uh, really as a grand challenge. And back then we hadn't even sequenced a bacterium. We'd only sequenced a few viruses. So when the scientists came along and said, Hey, let's, let's do, let's sequence the human genome. It was a big aspirational really controversial project. Oh, yeah. And but today we realize there's more and more value coming out of being able to read human genomes uh, in in many different fields. It's still very early because we don't have many people sequenced yet. And it's still a very specialized field. But it's it's starting to open up. We never go back. With GP Wright, uh, I was watching the, the, the field that is called synthetic biology start. It was like watching the electronics industry start. People were starting to design and build genetic structures, first at the level of proteins, doing that for the biotech industry, then metabolic pathways, being able to string together a number of enzymes to make a high value product, um, using, you know, assembling, uh, essentially changing the metabolism of a cell. And, and there were a few groups Craig Venter in particular that was that was focusing on making synthetic making the writing the entire genome. So uh, that doesn't most of that writing is copying. Most of that writing is copying because if you if you break the genome, the organism is going to grow and all the money you've made into making a designer genome is going to fail. So, so but it's starting to get to the point where you can do this design. And, and I was watching a number of companies pop up. Synthetic genomics being one of them, Ginkgo Bioworks, one of the one of the more successful groups in the field, Zymergen and others start to pop up and, and start to focus on application development, which is a really narrow specialization of this technology that you have to focus if you're going to do a business. And I saw that there was kind of a need for scientists to come together globally to build up to to really start thinking, well, in the same way that reading a genome has opened up genomics and and medicine and health and forensics and other things we we really need to start thinking about you know working together to create a a, a design platform not just tech, technologically but but in terms of society for writing larger genomes plants animals you know eventually one day human genomes but part of by putting the human in front of it you know because it was originally called the human genome project right Part of putting human in front of it engages humanity. It gets people listening uh, because we're all human. Um, if it's the dog genome project or the mouse genome project, it, most people aren't going to pay that much attention. So putting, making it the human genome project right really got people interested. And then we ended up getting rid of the H and just calling it genome project right because it's not just about humans. It, it's about being able to understand uh, and and deploy platforms, tools, scientific resources to be able to write large genomes and to do it in a safe and responsible way, to have standards, to look at the intellectual property, look at the ethics, look at the defense systems, the safety engineering, et cetera. So it was about creating this umbrella. And, and yeah, this is, 
this is a, a technology that many people today think is science fiction, but it's going to come fast and hard, just like reading DNA did. So I think it's just better to get ahead of the curve. And I've been delighted by how quickly the project has 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 brought together scientists from around the world to really start this engagement. It is a a meaningful scientific achievement, and it's it's something that as as a the guy wrote the definition of of, of the word biohacking, which, which has become a field. Uh, the reason hacking was important to me is I come from computer science, and when a company writes software, you simply don't know what's in there. Uh, and what hackers did is they said, well, hey, look, we'll write Linux. You want to see the source code? You want to see what's going on in there? We'll let you do it. And in a biological system, there's always something that, that works to grow and something that works to counter that. So we have predators and prey that keep each other in balance. And I feel like hackers actually keep big, dumb things from governments and big companies, uh, private enterprise, from doing really evil things. Because like uh, we actually know how it works, and what you're doing there is either stupid or evil. Uh, and it's a requirement as we continue to evolve our ability to edit our own DNA, um, that there's uh, an open discussion and that the science is available, and it's not only for uh, you know, the military use uh, to create super soldiers and stuff that's actually happening in various countries around the planet today, uh, where they're they're working on little secret programs like that. And I'm not talking Captain America, Avengers kind of stuff, but this is there. If you dig around, it's not conspiracy theory stuff at all. It, it's, you know, oh yeah, here's a proposal uh, to to see what happens. And you can see where that goes if, if the rest of us don't have access to those tools. Um, but it... It's all still kind of academic, uh, and and do, which is uh, my concern here. Am I going to be able to use this to edit my DNA? Because I've got some stuff in there that I, I kind of want to upgrade. I, I mean, are, are we going to be able to use the viruses you're using to to cure cancer in dogs? Can I just take a couple of those and just upgrade a little bit of my mitochondrial function? Uh, you know, change my hair color? I I don't know. Like like, come on, g give me some good science fiction stuff that's actually going to happen. Well, and okay, I'll speak for myself. Again, that's all I can speak for on this front. The reason why I focus on viral engineering um, and was is they're the smallest genomes. And most yeah. people don't realize the first one was synthesized in 2002. Like it's been 16 years. In those 16 years, only 25 synthetic viruses that I'm aware of have been engineered. And these Including are the smallest. Including yeah. smallpox. They recreated smallpox well, no, from no, scratch. They didn't no? make smallpox. Okay. They made horsepox, a very close okay. relative. So, <laughs> Got it. Thank you. <laughs> so, but, yeah. so, so and, and the first synthetic virus was polio, not the best ambassador for the field. <laughs> um, but that being said, uh, I, I, I've spent the last, uh, I've really spent the last 15 years going out and saying, well, these synthetic viruses are going to be pretty important because viruses mm -hmm. are essentially USB sticks for, you know, for, for biological cells. They drop programs in. Um, it's not like a USB stick that has a standard port because cells are all different. So you get viruses in all different shapes and sizes. But the, the, the core functionality of a virus is just to drop new code into a particular cell or organism. And if you think about it, uh, last I, I've read, and you probably are, are more upset than I am, about 8% of human DNA is viral in origin. Yes, they're, uh, they're deactivated retroviruses that brought in blocks of code uh, over, over our evolution. Um, because otherwise, you only get random mutation in the copying process or maybe a bit of duplication and, and, uh, and evolution in that sandbox. But, but viruses have the ability to bring in fairly large chunks of code and, and actually incorporate them into the genome per permanently. So I, I look at them as the IP packets on the biological network. Um, <laughs> so, so they're 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 absolutely essential in evolutionary processes, and yet um, uh, there there just wasn't a lot of activity in doing synthetic virus engineering. Um, and I mean, the beautiful part about doing synthetic viruses is you have atomic control over the design of the virus. It's not like you're working with a, a stock of the virus from a freezer, from an isolate from, you know, from from Africa. And you have to kind of sequence it just to under, you know, did you pull the right virus out of the fridge? Um, you know, this is this is where you sit down and can start doing CAD on the virus design. So. 
you know, just doing virus fabrication uh, and getting better at it should give the ability for for people to create biological apps, um, you know, for for virtually any application, wh whether it's to kill a cancer cell or whether it's to add a new feature or function into a human. One of the viruses that I absolutely love is a virus that that with uh, it's been it's been evolved and selected to have really high efficiency transfer to the retinal cells of the eye. There, the, it's part of a project to cure a certain form of genetic blindness. You just replace the code in the retinal cells that's defective and boom, you, your eye starts to work again. But I love the idea that one day I would just be able to put in code to give myself an expanded range of vision, you know, into the yeah. infrared or uh, et cetera. So, so that's possible. Um, now, how do you get to that point in any type of reasonable time frame? I think uh, it, it, I think self experimentation is going to be a, a part of that. I, I can't see how it how it's not. The biohackers are getting more and more sophisticated, but they're also getting, you know, they're also building much more of a community and generating their own forms of oversight and and uh, you know, for the better part, regulation. If they do something stupid. It makes front page news. <laughs> it, it does. And, and I I feel really strongly a, around this whole concept of medical or biological freedom. And only one of the founding fathers in the US uh, was from the medical field. And uh, he warned you know, there will be great medical tyranny if you don't put this in the Bill of Rights. And all the other businessmen and attorneys told him, you're, you're crazy, and didn't listen to him. That was Dr. Benjamin Rush, by the way. Um, and uh, when, you, when you look forward to where we are now, I think that there's a great argument that says, look, if you want to create a virus that does wacky stuff to you, that include, including may kill you, go for it as long as it's not transmissible. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, th there's, there's a, a, I think, a very firm ethical line there. Uh, but right now, you kind of have to leave the U.S. to do the coolest stem cell treatments uh, to experiment with viruses uh, legally, unless you manufacture it yourself. But if you buy a virus from someone, you want to use it yourself. You know, oh, you're somehow you know breaking the law or doing something you're not supposed to do. Um, do you see that that changing, or do you see some countries having uh, massive advantages uh, like Singapore or India, where you can do medical experiments on consenting people who are probably going to die anyway? Uh, and and you can just do it. Whereas in the U.S., you might think about it for 20 years while the person wastes away. It, is this going to change here? I, I think it has to. Um, uh, I, whenever I've had the opportunity to speak to government uh, here in the United States, I've, I've pointed out that there are some really uh, strong headwinds. Uh, and it's not just the United States. It, oh, it's yeah. the West. Um, and in part because it, 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 you know, there's many reasons. There's some of them are some of them are religious. Some of them are are there's a legacy biotech industry that you know wouldn't doesn't really want to see new entrants come in that have access to these types of tools that cost you know a, a fraction uh, uh, of of the old tools and the old approaches. Um, and and when you start doing self experimentation. Uh, you know, you, you're going to create a little bit of noise and activity. We saw that when computers went personal. Um, so, but I, I don't know how, put this way, it would have to be really um, prohibited and restrictive uh, to, to block this type of, of activity in, in anywhere in the world. So I think, I think right now we're, going, we're seeing the prolifer proliferation of biohacking, but we're also seeing some countries. And, and I was in Hong Kong recently uh, by invitation. I'm going to Singapore uh, by invitation in, in January. These are countries that are, are really looking at biotech as the next big platform. And, and they're making it easier and supporting people to try new ambitious projects um, and clearing a path to market. Um, uh, you know, in, in a much more progressive way than I'm seeing in the United States right now. I have a friend who was going to have children with very severe birth defects and knew it genetically. Uh, the guy's very successful. So he and his wife uh, went out uh, out of the U.S. and uh, edited the DNA uh, in their own germline to remove the genetic defect. 
so their children were born healthy and their children's children have zero chance of having that thing that had been in his family for a very long time. That's already happening. Yeah. And it, I mean, it, it, I think it'll be normal in 10 years. Say, oh, you know, we're going to have kids. Let's just check out our genes and make sure everything's legit. And if it's not legit, let's just do a little tweaking. But it's a very fine line because, oh, by the way, uh, this one thing, uh, this one gene that we know is associated with, with very high intelligence, and there are actually several genes uh, that way. <laughs> Why don't we just toss a couple of those in there? Uh, and we are going to, whether we like it or not, with GP Wright and other projects like that, we're going to fundamentally change the speed of evolution of the human species. Uh, and I'm, I'm all for that. Do you agree that that's going to happen? And do you think it's a good idea? Uh I, th I think it's unstoppable. I'm kind of a fan of Kevin Kelly um, yeah. and some of his writing, what technology He's been on the show wants. too. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I, you know, I really believe that it, it, it can't be stopped. Once the technology exists, mm -hmm. it's going to proliferate. You just want to steer it towards good, but that's not the technology. Uh, you know, that's not what technology does. That's what intention does. Um, and, and so I think we have a responsibility to, to, as, as a society to use these technologies in positive ways. And, and I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head when it comes to understanding, um, it, when it comes to, when it comes to giving our kids a leg up, you know, today we, we, we give parents a leg up in having kids with IVF technologies, and these are still continuing to evolve and improve I think that we just crossed the 40 year anniversary of, of the first uh, IVF baby uh, last July. Um, today, it's pretty much accepted. Controversial then, accepted today. Um, we could still room for improvement. Let's make it $500 instead of $15,000. Um, uh, okay, great. Um, when it comes to editing our genomes, I think if it's so that our kids will be born healthy, that's great. And, and, I think you can make the case for that. It's genetic surgery. We use every other type of surgery to make a kid happy and healthy. Genetic surgery is just a new tool. When it comes to when it comes to giving them adding genes um, to them to give them a leg up, I think there you just have a slightly higher bar that to demonstrate. You have to have the body of work to basically demonstrate that you're not going to break them. Um, yeah. And that comes with with animal studies and being able to do this type of engineering in animals, plants, et cetera. As we get better at those technologies, you, we become more comfortable with it. But yeah, then there'll be some people that will just try it because the environment is more permissive or they're just not afraid of the technologies. And, and you know, uh, they'll they'll kind of separate from the pack. They might even be criticized for a while. But then as as the results start to get better known, uh, they you know, it's a lesson for everyone. And as their and as their children become adults that are hyper intelligent and super strong and long lived, and everyone sees what happened, they're like, maybe I should have done that. Uh, yeah. maybe, maybe we want everyone to have this instead of just a few wealthy people. And and it may not necessarily be a biological fix. Again, today we're intelligent just if we have the internet, um, and because <laughs> you know, like we are, I, I I need the internet to in, to reinforce a lot of my conversations today. Um, you know, just because I my brain doesn't remember the facts. Um, uh, I don't know if I want a brain that you know that remembers facts perfectly because uh, I've met people with some of those savant abilities, and and they've had it's hard. To move on if you can't forget. <laughs> they, they also, those extreme intelligences and those other skills usually come with other neurological atypical things, autism, schizophrenia, <laughs> uh, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. And when it comes to strength, that that personally never mattered to me so much, but then I like heavy equipment. Um, and, and okay, maybe they'll, one day we'll have the mutant Olympic games and people will just push these technologies in their bodies <laughs> in whole new ways. I don't know, but, but I've had serious conversations with people that are looking, well, how do you change humanity so we can better survive in space and not get yeah. bone loss or, or go and live on Mars and, 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 you know, create a society there. So I think, uh, I think, you know, these things, uh, before the before they happen, you tend to think negatively, and then when the situations arise when you need them, uh, you start you start to apply them in positive and and uh, in positive ways. You can't really rush it. <laughs> I, I've had the great fortune to chat with the the founders of the X Prize, uh, the people who funded the X Prize, the the first prize for private exploration of space or at least private space travel, and I'm 
they don't all believe this, but I, I fundamentally believe that if we are going to colonize other worlds, the first place to start is in hacking the human body because we're just too frail for that kind of stuff. And if life evolves to survive in certain environments, we are going to have to force that evolution to survive in environments that aren't this one. And people, people say, oh, you're, you know, that, that means you're playing God. Well, I, if that's what you want to call it, okay. <laughs> uh, but that, that's not the intent here. The intent here is, you know, if, if I want to be able to survive somewhere, or maybe I won't because my, my biology is already off to the, off to the races. Uh, but if we want to make people who can survive somewhere else, they're probably going to be a little different genetically than we are. And, and maybe that's a good thing. Well, and I, I think even before we start modifying ourselves, I had a conversation about this recently with an, on another podcast. I think you have to start modifying the plants and animals that you're bringing to sustain you somewhere else. And so you start building up this, this understanding of what is a positive change to survive in these new environments. Um, and, and then we know how to engineer ourselves moving forward if, uh, for better. Um, I, I think it's actually hard to sit down and make a change in humans uh, before you kind of build up the support system for for that. But um, but yeah, it, we, I think it's time that we start recognizing that biology is a really powerful and accessible technology, like computing. Computing is the is what's you know is is, is what's giving us a lot of the capability to to tap into biology and understand it and manipulate it. But, you know, I think it's time we start recognizing that this is a it's going to be one of the foundations uh, for moving forward as a as a species. We're not going to get rid of computers, I don't think. And I think we're going to start using biology a lot more. And the intersection of those two fields is incredible right now. It is uh, one of the most exciting times I could imagine to be alive. And it's always hard to see how rapidly the changes will come because we always look backwards and we don't even have a very good 25 year history, but you look at the $20,000 mobile phone at $20 a minute to use it, uh, which existed in my lifetime. And the, the dollar cell phones are all over the planet. Now, uh, the same thing's happening in, in your field, which is, uh, which is amazing. And one of the first applications we haven't talked about yet is you are making viruses to cure cancer in dogs. Tell me about that. Well, it, it started off pretty easy. I, I want to build genomes. Uh, my resources are limited. I don't have a, I don't have a, a biotech company behind me. In fact, I was working with Autodesk, so we had design tools. Um, I needed to find people that were interested in de making designer viruses and and helping them do it digitally. And so that's what we did. One of the one of the first people that I worked with was uh, was a Stanford researcher by the name of Paul Jaschke that had experience with a particular virus that infects E. coli bacteria um, that had been very well studied. That the virus was called Phyx one seven four, and it was like the second synthetic virus made on the planet back in two thousand and three. So we we learned uh, we learned how to how to make a synthetic. Mm, antibiotic, essentially. And then I started uh, wanting to try it in cancer because every cancer is different. We know that just from sequencing. It's kind of an infection of your body with your own cells. I believe that we need to have personalized treatments to beat cancer and viruses just are, a, it's a way to drop it's a way to drop code into these cancer cells to kill them. There was already a pretty big field in, in doing cancer fighting viruses. I just wanted to digitize it. Um, so I found, a, I found a veterinary group that had run a, a clinical trial in dogs for a type of bone cancer that dogs get. They had already made an engineered virus that targeted these bone cancer cells specifically and run the trial. Uh, I just approached them and said, how would you like to start doing this digitally? How would you like to design and build the virus from scratch? And just we'll just copy the recombinant virus, the engineered virus that you made as kind of step one, but put in a barcode so we can sh demonstrate that it was actually made from scratch digitally. Um, but then let's let's learn how to really crank this wheel and take biopsy information from from an animal with cancer, make a custom virus and get it into the clinic faster and faster. If it takes two months now, that's too long, but let's try and get it down to two weeks. 
And, and that's where we've been working. And, and the technology is supporting that approach. The, the computing and design is getting cheaper, synthesis is getting cheaper um, and faster. And, and certainly all the molecular diagnostics of a cancer cell is getting to be pretty much routine now. If you had cancer, would you go do that? If I had cancer, yeah, if I was diagnosed with a cancer, I would absolutely go and start engineering my therapies tomorrow. Um, uh, it, and how long I, would it think, typically take to do that? Uh, it depends on the size of the virus. Um, right now, it's it's not like uh, it's not like computing where the cost per bit is is pretty much identical. The right now, the, you synthesize small fragments of DNA. That's really cheap, but then you have to assemble the small fragments into longer fragments, um, and eventually to get to genome size. Uh, that assembly process today is really inefficient. Um, so uh, it, it's a cost factor. But uh, the, the virus that we made for dogs was about 34,000 bits of code, 34,000 bases. And it was synthesized and assembled and tested in two weeks. Uh, sorry, two months. All right. So, so that would be your first, your first step. Obviously, you'd get diagnosed and look what was going on. But you would you'd go in and start doing that. Are there billionaires, uh, superheroes, or, or any other people like that uh, living uh, in, in caves or invisible jets who are actually probably doing this to save their own lives today? Not that I'm aware of with uh, designer viruses, but I, uh, if, if anyone out there that is a billionaire um, wants to start, <laughs> call me. Um, uh, or if they have a dog, um, like part of the next step of work is to go and find, um, we're trying to do this all open source, by the way, like right. the, the, my philosophy is, is, as you mentioned uh, around Linux. In fact, I wrote a chapter for Tim O'Reilly back in 2005 on open source synthetic biology in a book all on open source computing. It was a little ahead of its time, but the but I want to see this platform be made to just eradicate cancer. And the kind of the next step in the business development is to find high net worth individuals with sick dogs, because we have to keep this open and transparent if we're going to have it really thrive. Well, there I, I know because some of them have reached out to me, but there are some very influential and successful people who listen to the show, uh, which is is uh, an honor for me just to, you know, anytime I know someone who's really super busy, take some time to listen. I'm like, hey, great. Uh, we must be doing something right. Uh, but they've reached out and there are people out there who have maybe dogs with cancer. But really, if you have unlimited resources and you have cancer, nothing else matters. And you will put all of your resources into stopping that. And you don't care about breaking laws. Uh, you don't care about breaking rules because, well, <laughs> oh, great. I followed the rules and I died a painful death. So it wouldn't surprise me if you got a call or two um, from people here this this episode. And this is that self-experimentation. And the law says, well, you have to wait till it's approved. But Mother Nature says, you're going to die before it's confused. Screw the law. And and this is just a fundamental human thing. And what I am really inspired by, Andrew, is that you said this is going to be open source. Because it is entirely unfair that that someone with X amount of money is able to go out and access something that isn't that terribly expensive to do that's probably cheaper than chemo. Uh, for a couple of years and keep cheaper than traditional cancer treatments. Yet there are a whole bunch of people who will die from cancer who could do this, but either don't have the economic resources or the legal resources to do it. But someone has to do it first. And it's usually going to be the desperate wealthy people uh, because that's how it works. I, I appreciate that. And, and it's one of the reasons why I've championed only N of one therapies. In other words, it's just for you. It's not ever going to be made or sold to anyone else. It's just for you. And that makes a, a, a ton of sense for cancer. It doesn't make a ton of sense for vaccines. So, you know, a lot of the synthetic virology work has been focused at vaccines. But there you always need to be able to manufacture millions of, of doses and, and demonstrate a very high bar of safety. If you're doing it for someone that has cancer and conventional therapies just aren't working, they're part of the R&D from day one. Um, and, and as fast as you can iterate your, your engineering, the faster you can get it into them. And, and I really do believe that this approach to cancer, uh, is going to just change, uh, just, just make it a managed disease over the next 20 years. Like, I really believe that we're already seeing the first personalized therapies, uh, in CAR T cells be approved now. And so we're moving away from products to kind of platform technologies that can make you know, pump out personalized drugs. We've got a lot of room for improvement, but I think 
that viruses and virus-like nanoparticles that are kind of built from scratch are going to be a major avenue towards this type of therapy. Uh, this has uh, been a fascinating discussion, and I've got one more question for you, Andrew. If someone came to you tomorrow and said, I want to perform better at everything I do as a human being, based on your life's experience, not just your work, but everything you know, everything that's made you able to do the things you're doing, what are the three most important pieces of advice you have for me? What would you offer them? Wow. Uh, that's a really that's a really interesting question. Um, I try and think about that in in my own life. Um, yeah. Because uh, I live a I live a very different life than most people. I, I focus uh, I focus on what's important. Um, so if you want to get better at, at something, you've got to focus. You can't do everything well. Um, you know what I particularly focus on is is just geeking out about the future and and trying to find ways to prototype it. Um, uh, I I think it's it's stay healthy. Um, because if you're, if you don't physically keep your container and your mind in good shape, you're just not going to be good at, at, at using that equipment. Um, and, and probably the next one is, is, uh, is go and self-experiment, go and start finding ways, uh, try new things to improve your performance. You have to be able to measure it to, yeah. to, to go and to go and get, you know, qualitative data and quantitative data that, that's convincing to others, but but it only has to be convincing to you, but you still have to measure it and, and find out what works for you. If it's getting the right amount of sleep or diet or microdosing or whatever it happens to be, um, you know, go and go and start studying your own body. You're, you are absolutely unique uh, uh, as an individual. Um, you can get some guidance from the mean, but at the end of the day, you, you're, a, you're an experiment of one. Beautiful advice, uh, and thanks for sharing it. And thanks for all the work you're doing. Keep on figuring out what's going on in our DNA and making it so all of us know about it. And if I ever have an issue with cancer, which I'm not planning on having given that I keep those mitochondria working, but if I ever do, I'm gonna be calling you and saying, help me hack a virus, man. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> thanks, Andrew. If you enjoyed today's episode, I would love it if you went onto Amazon and you took about 10 seconds to leave a review that said one of my books was worth reading because if you've read Headstrong, you've read The Bulletproof Diet, you know how much work went into those and you know that there's stuff in there that you can use and I read the reviews and it helps other people find the books. So do that, leave a review. And if you'd like to learn more about Andrew's work or about GP Wright, and you're interested in the field, gp-wright.com, that's gp-w-r-i-t-e.com, which has all the information about this amazing project uh, that Andrew is helping to spearhead. 